Praise God. Another thing, uh, just from, I know we've already seen a video about it, but as a pastor, I want to say vote and vote righteous. It's important that you do that. I encourage you to look at the candidates' views on religious liberty, specifically prayer, the Bible. Look at what they believe about churches and pastors. I'd say, thank God we have a governor who declared that church was essential right? He said, hey, church is essential. I have friends in other states that their governor is anti-church. And I'm telling you, they shut them down. And it wasn't just a, a but anyway, it, yeah. <laughs> also, look at who is for, look at the issues. Who is, who is for God's design of male and female? right? That's something you need to look at and say, all right, how do I vote? And, and know what they vote, not just name recognition, or I saw this guy, he looks nice. I'm going to put his name on there. Know what they stand for. Do they stand for the illegal murder of babies by abortion, right? God is against abortion. Why would you vote for abortion, right? And so again, some people say, well, we're pro-choice, you know, pro-choice, but then they force you to get a vaccine, force you to shut your church down, force you to do whatever. You can say these things. You know, there's a lot of things that are being forced and freedoms that are being lost. And I hope I don't make some folks here offended or mad, but as I say, if this rubs your fur the wrong way, then you need to turn the cat around. It, I would rather offend you than offend God. That's all I'm saying. And I know people, well, you don't want to offend anyone. And I know this might offend some people, but I'm telling you, I would rather offend you than to offend God because God is not pleased with certain things. And we see that one of those being homosexuality. It's not right. We live in a free country where thankfully we have the freedom of speech to be able to speak out against things that the Bible says homosexuality is wrong. It's wrong. I have a friend who in England, he was preaching this on TV and uh, they fined him $50,000 for reading the Bible that said homosexuality is wrong. Scripture. He was reading the scripture. And I thought how funny that is that he was reading from the King James Bible. It's like, it's your Bible, England. King James was the one that had this Bible made, right? And so, again, it's important to realize there are certain things that are right and there are things that are wrong. And it's important that we stand up for what the freedoms that God has given us. It is a gift of God that we have the ability to be able to preach this way and to be able to talk this way and to speak out against sin and call sin what it is and read the Bible. It's important and it's vital and again, God's going to take care of us. But uh, there was a coach, Coach Kennedy in Washington State, who recently, actually about seven years ago, was fired because he prayed after the game. He would go to the center of the field and just kneel down and just thank God for a safe game for his players and for whether they won or lost, he would thank God. And they fired him over the school board. Did you know they did that unconstitutionally? They say, well, you can't pray on school property. Did you know that's not true? We even believe it ourselves because we've heard it for so long. But the Supreme Court said, no, that is not constitutional. They said, you have to give him his job back and pay over $5 million in fees. Yeah. I'm telling you, we have to realize you can pray in school. Did you know that? That's awesome. I have a friend in Joshua that's not far from here in high school. She was reading her Bible in school and somebody walks up to her a student and goes, can you have that here? A Bible. Hey, listen, we have the freedom of religion, not freedom from religion. Okay. It's important to know that and to realize that. And so again, even teachers they're saying now can legally pray in schools. You say, what? Yeah, the Supreme Court said so. So, praise God. We're not going to force religion on anyone, right? And you say, well, I don't want to force our religion or belief on any kids or whatever. But I'm telling you, they're forcing their atheism, their evolution. They're forcing this, their homosexual transgender stuff on the kids. And so, again, we say, well, I don't want to force it, but it's being forced, right? And so, you got to stand up and say, no, listen, I don't endorse any candidate. But as a pastor, I can say whatever I want to personally. And I can, I do that legally. We've, we have lawyers that have said so. As a pastor, you can do anything you want to. He said, you just, as an organization, you can't necessarily um, basically endorse anyone. But praise God, we're keeping the law and 
people need to know there is a law and we need to stand up for the law to say, hey, these are the laws. They need to be kept. Everybody has right to pray if they want to. They have a right to do whatever they want. Uh, my son, tomorrow, he's starting a, his first day of his, of his Bible club in his school, in a public school, the God group. It's exciting. We're, we're praying for him. Keep him in your prayers. We want to exercise our God-given right to vote and to love everybody. I'd say love everybody. But call sin, sin. Right? We don't hate anybody. I'm not going to go uh, attack anyone over their whatever they believe or whatever. But I'm going to stand up and say, no, that's wrong and it's against the law and you need to stop. Okay? It's, all right, enough. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Again, I hope I didn't offend you, but I'd rather, I'd rather, you watch the anointing of the Holy Spirit in a place where they care more about what God thinks than what people think, the anointing will fall on that place. The power of God will manifest in that place. I'm telling you, you're going to be blessed if you'll do that. And then just smile and love people. I'm telling you, we don't hate anybody. It's not hate, hate speech to say the truth. So we're getting in our series, Open Handed. It's generosity, right? We're open handed. God's generous provision is what we're talking about this morning. God's generous provision. God provides generously. And anytime uh, preachers, especially nowadays, which I understand, there's been things out of balance when it comes to prosperity in the church and in preaching. But when preachers talk about prosperity, people say, oh no, he's preaching that prosperity gospel. And there are people that are against it. And I understand, really, they're not against the prosperity gospel. What they're against is the greed, right? The selfishness. They're, they're against the love of money gospel that has been preached. And it has. I, I'll admit it. If, if anybody would know, I've been in church my whole life, even in charismatic circles. And sometimes greed, manipulation, and the love of money comes in some of the preaching. And it needs to stop. But... The fact is, God wants everyone to prosper. Amen. Luke 4, 18, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? To preach the good news to the poor. That was the first thing Jesus said. The Spirit of the Lord's on me to preach the good news to the poor. Well, what is the good news to the poor? You don't have to be po, no mo. <laughs> Come on. God wants you blessed. That's good news to a poor person. And so again, that's prosperity. But what's wrong with prosperity? Nothing if you preach it in the right context and in the right balance. God expects you to prosper, actually. Did you know that? He is a generous provider. In Deuteronomy 8.18, it says, But thou shalt remember the Lord your God. It is he that gives you power to get wealth. If wealth is bad, why would God give you the power to get it? Right? That he may, and this is why he wants you to have wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers that it is this day. God made a promise. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless those who have faith like Abraham, and you're going to be blessed like Abraham is blessed. And that is with riches and blessing and all those things. It's a promise that God's going to fulfill, and he expects you to prosper, right? Isaiah 48, 17 says, Thus says the Lord thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teaches you to profit, which leads you by the way that you should go. Again, God teaches us to profit and to grow. He expects it. He wants that, right? So why would I preach anything less or to preach that God wants you poor or that God really to be holy is to be broke? It's not the case. So, you cannot give what you don't have. And God has ways, generous ways of getting you provision. God is a very generous God. He's not a tightwad. He wants you blessed and he'll get it to you. There's so many ways. I was out soul winning one time and I came across, I come across thousands of people in my, on the street. Some people, they don't really have a need. They just want money for drugs or whatever, right? And I understand that. But I came across this situation where this person had a genuine need, needed some food or whatever. And, they, and I believe in keeping people alive and helping them until they can get on their feet or whatever they may need. And I honestly wanted to give this person, but I, I didn't have any money on me, no cash. And I said, you know, I would love to help you. I said, but honestly, I don't have any. And I looked down and there was a $20 bill. And I said, hang on a second. 
second. Here you go. Here, here's $20. He goes, how did you do that? I said, God is a generous provider. I'm telling you, he walked away looking around. I tell him, seek first the kingdom of God. <laughs> then all these things will be added to you, right? A lot of times we're walking over, over $100 bills looking for pennies. That's what it is. When you're looking for money, you're passing up the greatest blessing of all, which is the Holy Spirit, which is God. Don't chase after money. Chase after him. And I'm telling you, there's money all along the path. So God will provide. I've had need at times. I mean, there were, there were needs I had that I knew there's no way I can meet this need. When I was first starting a ministry, I had um, a car that I had given my other car away in order to go into ministry. It's a long story. But I had this car that needed fixing. $800 is what it costs for this car. And I'm in Bible college. I'm actually, you know, not making much at all, just enough to barely live in ministry. And I need 800 bucks now to fix my car. I was in a meeting in our church service. As I, I look out, there's about 2,000 people in our congregation. And at that time, I was ushering. And I saw this man in the crowd that I thought, I look like I could be related to that guy. And so I went up to him and I said, hey, are you related to the Birdwells? And he goes, they're my grandparents. I said, no way. Come to find it was my cousin. And so I said, well, hey, it's good to see you here, man. It's awesome, right? So then after the service, he comes up to me and he says, hey, I'm just curious. I well, how's your car running? And I said, well, funny you would ask. <laughs> I don't normally tell people my problems. If I have a need, I go to God with it. And I went to God with it. But he asked me specifically, how's your car running? I think this might be God. So I said, you know, it's actually not uh, right now. And it's, they say it's going to be about 800 bucks to fix it. He goes, well, God's made me a pretty good wrench. And he said, I just don't know why, but I just feel led to fix your car for you. And I said, well, I don't know why, but I feel led to receive it. <laughs> so came, got me, took me to the auto parts store and said, while we're at it, why don't we get your oil changed? We might as well replace your thermostat because that's going to need to happen. All these things and paid for it all and did it all himself. And praise God, the need was met, but it was more than what I even needed. It was a blessing to me. And I was thankful. God meets needs and he can provide for you generously, right? And you don't have to go around telling everybody your problems. When you're looking to people to be your source, you're, they're not your provider. God is your provider. Amen? The economy is not your provider. The president is not your provider. Even your job or your, your employer, you've got to say, okay, Lord, I look to you as my provider. I know some people say, well, I don't really need to hear this. I have all the money I need. This is obviously for somebody else in the room. But Romans 1.17 says this, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I'll say this right now. I think we are a very blessed campus. We've got a lot of very blessed people here in this church. And you don't have many needs, if any. Some of you got everything you need or want. But I'm telling you, the just shall live by faith. And it's important, even if you've got everything, to still not lose the fact that you're living by faith. And God has been known to send the richest people in the world places with no money. And say, leave your money at home. He did that to his disciples. Remember that? When he sent them out and said, don't take with you in your, your wallet. Don't take a purse, ladies. And they went out and he said, did you lack anything? They said, no, I didn't lack anything. How did that happen? God said, I want to teach you living by faith. Not that you don't have it, but I don't want you to depend on it and to trust in it. First Timothy 6, 17 says, charge them that are rich in this world, which is us, right? They say, if you can get $10 in one week, in one week, if you can get your hands on $10, you're richer than the majority of the planet. That's a blessing. You really are rich compared to the rest of the world that make a dollar a day, right? So charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, 
nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. God gives us richly all things, not the economy, not our job, not whatever it is that we're so focused on. And when you go for a while without a financial need and you have so many things, you have to be careful not to be trusting in those things, right? And, and get your focus off of God. I believe God is warning us all not to forget who the provider is and that he provides generously. I had another friend who's a pastor, Pastor Greg Moore. And uh, now he's the uh, a director of ministry at Karis Bible College up in Colorado. He's a Bible college director. And so he was telling us a story about when he was early in ministry and he was working between jobs, between ministry assignments. And he had this, uh, this time where he was working on commission as a consultant and it was famine or feast. If anybody has ever worked in sales or in real estate or whatever, and you understand how it can be sometimes when there's no commission. And he was in one of those times, he was two and a half weeks behind on his bills. And he's like, Lord, what am I going to do? He goes to church. This group, this, uh, guest minister came in this lady and she said, I have a word for you. Gave him a word and said, this is the word that the Lord has for you. First Timothy five, eight. This was the word from God, from God for him. And if, but if any provide not for his own and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. He said, Oh, thanks. I feel much better now. Whoever doesn't provide for his own family is worse than an infidel, which that word infidel means an unbeliever. And she goes, hang on, but that's not the word. This is the word from the Lord. He wants to tell you he lives by that verse too. He lives by that verse too. And you need to realize, first of all, God is your father. You are his own. He is not an infidel and he'll take care of you. Amen. God is your father. You are his own. He's not an infidel and he's going to take care of you. Wow. What a powerful revelation. Obviously God took care of him. He's one of the most blessed people I know on the planet. That guy. God has blessed him more than money. He's got the money, but more than that. Blessings in family, blessings in business, blessing in everything he put his hands to. I'm telling you, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and add no sorrow to it. Amen. I want everyone to just say, God is my father. Is my father. I, am I am his own. He's not worse than an infidel. He's not worse than an infidel. He, will he will take care of me. See, God is the source of your supply, not your bank account, not your job not your assets, not your connections. I've known people that before they said, well, you may not have much money, but you have a lot of connections because of your ministry status, where you've been. You've got a lot of connections. I do have a lot of connections, but I don't trust in them. Connections run out. Those connections can turn on you in a day, just like they did with Jesus. One day, one day they're saying, hail him, hail him. The next time, nail him, nail him. You can't trust in your connections. I have a friend, another friend, Pastor Don Clowers. He's on Joyce Meyer's board. He is a, a good friend. He was at a baseball game, took his, his grandkids to the Texas Rangers game, I believe it was. But he's at this baseball game, and as he gets there, he realized he didn't have his wallet. He was like, oh, no, I don't have my wallet. Um, I don't have any money to buy you kids any food or anything. And they were like, we're hungry. So he's like, what am I going to do? I'm at this game. He has no money. He's walking around. He's thinking maybe his connections, right? So he's walking around looking at people smiling like, do you know me? Like, do you, do you know who I am? <laughs> like, maybe somebody will say, oh, I know you. Say, hey, can I have some money or can I borrow or whatever? He couldn't find anybody that knew him. His connections worked at, didn't work out at all. It made me think, I don't think they ever did get any food on that trip. <laughs> just, trust has to be in the Lord. Say, God, go to him. Say, Lord, help us. God, we're looking to you as our supplier. I don't know if you've ever been in a place like that where God was your ultimate source of supply. 
My dad used to tell me, and I didn't understand it as a kid. He said, I wake up every day in the middle of the Sahara Desert with nothing. I said, man, dad, that's rough. What do you mean? What do you mean you wake up in the middle of the Sahara Desert with nothing every day? He said, that's how much I depend on God for everything. I said, wow, that's good. To where if I don't have God in my life, I'm not going to make it. I depend on him. My dad was a great man of faith. Did things that I was on my knees praying, Lord, please let us not die. Let him not die. (laughs) But God said, and they worked out. It was amazing. So regardless of where you are in life, look to God as your generous provider. Jesus left heaven and came to earth to show us that God is our provider. Galatians 2 and verse 20, and I love this scripture. It says, the last half, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The life that I live in this body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's how I live my life. So when disease comes, I live my life by the faith of the Son of God, by Jesus, who loved me. He gave himself for me. If financial lack comes, I'm living by faith. I live by life. I live by the life that Jesus has provided for me to live, right? I don't have to worry or be afraid. And people say, but you might die. I say, the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm not afraid. Don't let fear come in. If the devil's worst threat to you is he'll kill you, say, praise God, hallelujah, give it your best shot because I know where I'm going. I have no fear of death. Where is your sting, the Bible says? Death, where is your grave? Where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? You can't do anything because I live by faith anyway. My times are in his hands. I trust the Lord with it. And you can too. Now, it might make your wife a little nervous, but... You can trust the Lord. (laughs) Hallelujah. Don't worry. I know my wife sometimes thinks, man, you just don't worry ever. I don't know. Maybe she doesn't. I don't know. But she always talks about how I'm just happy-go-lucky and just walk around because I don't live with worry. There's so much, I'm free. It's, it's a bondage. I remember the day fear was like a shackle around my ankle. And I, I remember the day in a church service, much like this one, where the Holy Spirit touched me and I got free of that. And it's like I felt, I even drew a little picture of this ball and chain and this chain snapping off of my leg as I was free. I knew I'm free from fear. It's a good thing. Amen. So have faith and God will provide whatever you need. Abraham was a man in the Bible who was very wealthy. We talked about him. He had no needs, right? And so because of your faith, God told Abraham, I want you blessed. And Abraham said, hey, I got everything I want, you know, everything. He said, do you have everything? He said, well, everything but a son. I don't have a son, anyone to carry on my lineage. That I would like. And God says, boom, you got it. Gave him Isaac, right? Long story short. He got Isaac. Now, can you imagine trying to buy Abraham a gift at Christmas? The man who has everything. (laughs) I know people like that. I'm thinking, what could I possibly buy them? That They've got everything they could possibly want. And now Abraham did. He even had a son. Everything he could want. And God told Abraham, listen, I want you to sacrifice your only son that I gave you. And now it's like, oh, great, bless you. Abraham goes up the mountain three days away with his son Isaac to sacrifice. And Isaac says, hang on, as he's walking, right? You see Isaac, he's going up the hill. He's got this, the wood for the sacrifice on his back. And he's walking with his dad and says, dad, I see the fire. We've got that. I see the wood. I'm carrying that. But where is the sacrifice? Don't we usually have like a lamb or a ram or some male goat or something that we're going to sacrifice a male lamb? And, and, and he says, Jehovah Jireh, son, Jehovah Jireh. What does that mean? Jehovah Jireh in Hebrew means the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. God will provide. Don't worry. And so the true story is when they got to the top of Mount Moriah there in Israel, uh, Isaac was tied up by Abraham, laid on the altar as he was up about to sacrifice his beloved son. God said to Abraham, stop. That's enough. I just wanted to know you would. And that you, by you doing that, I believe there were things that set things in motion 
The devil could never say, how did you do that? Why would you do that for them? He offered his only son and was willing. And God said, that's it. You don't have to. I'm sending my son in place of your son. Because your son can't die for the sin of the world. My son can. My son is the only spotless lamb that there is. But because he was willing, in Genesis twenty two twelve, 12, he said, Lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son for me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him, now here's the provision of the Lord, a ram was caught in the thicket by his horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, and the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. In other words, where God leads, he feeds. And where God guides, he provides. As we say this day, where God guides, he provides. And God's leading you, he's feeding you. Amen? You're going to be taken care of. Uh, there's a place called there where God says, I want you to go there. And there I have commanded a widow woman to take care of you. You know, the story of Elijah. He proclaimed a famine, a drought over all the earth. There was no rain for years. And so how's he going to be taken care of? He just cut off his own provision, his own supply. He said, I want you to go to the brook Cherith first, and I'm going to have ravens come feed you food. Now listen, God has a million ways to generously provide for you, even if he has to use birds to bring you your steak dinner. Could you imagine as he's sitting there by the brook Cherith and hear all these birds show up with all this meat and food? He's like, man, this is awesome. I could just see the king over in his palace going, where was my food? It was just right here on the balcony terrace. It's gone. Birds are whoo, to Elijah. He's getting your steak today. <laughs> man, what's up with these birds? They keep stealing our food. And meanwhile, Elijah's over there. He said, go there and I'm going to provide for you there. Now, if he had gone somewhere else, the provision wouldn't have been there because the provision is where God tells you to go. So he's there. Then the brook dries up. And that happens to us many times where we say, oh, the Lord has provided and we're testifying. We're giving a testimony about it and sharing in church. Let me tell y'all, God came through and this blessing and it sure did happen. This brook has been, the ravens have been bringing me food. And the next thing you know, it dries up and you're like, oh, I guess that wasn't God. No, it was God. What is he telling you next? That was your provision for that time. Right? The devil didn't steal your blessing. The brook is dried up because it's time for you to do something else. God's saying, okay. And so instead of saying, why, God, why? Say, what now, God? What now? What do I do now? Listen. And he said, I want you to go to Zarephath. There's a widow there. And I've commanded her to feed you and to take care of you. So guess what? He shows up to this lady who has one meal left. I just think that's so funny. God's showing I am your provider, not that widow woman. I am providing. And he's showing the widow woman that cruise of oil and that little handful of meal that you have left is not your supply. That's not your source. Because she said, we're going to eat this. My son and I, we're going to get a few sticks. We're going to eat it and we're going to die. And, and Elijah said, make me this, give me that first. Which again cracks me up because it would be in the news today if a preacher came and told a widow woman, give me your last bit of money. <laughs> they would say, I can't believe a preacher would say that. I can't believe he would do that. People get mad and offended and leave because this preacher took this widow woman. But you know what? She needed to give it. Because you cannot reap a blessing and a harvest without sowing a seed. And God doesn't respond to need. He responds to faith. People think that. They think, God, don't you see my need? He's saying, I'm looking for your faith. Where's your faith? Well, God, I can't, I can't give away my last meal. You might as well <laughs> make it a seed. If it's not enough to meet your need, make it a seed. And say, okay, Lord, I'm sowing. And trust the Lord. Because then again, that showed where her trust was. She said, I'm going to trust you, man of God, and give you my last cake. 
and then my son and I are going to die. But what happened was, as she made it, she, she poured the little cruise of oil that she had just a little bit, and then the, the meal that she took out and put there, and then as she made the cake, she gave it to him. He goes, check your, your jar. Well, there's still a little bit more. Maybe, an, maybe I had enough to make two cakes. <laughs> so that's good. Thank God. We have enough for us to eat and you. And he said, well, check your cruise again. He looks in there again. Whoa, there's still some more oil. So, and they ate like that for over a year. And I'm telling you this, don't you think she probably had people over to her house within that year when they found out they were eating there? You know, everybody and their dog shows up when they find out you got food in a famine. And so then they find out, wow, there's no telling how many people they fed for over a year with that. That's powerful. So back to, uh, back to Abraham, right? He took his son off the altar. They sacrificed the male sheep that was caught in the bushes. And Genesis twenty two fifteen 15 says, The angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. Now again, this is what God was really trying to get to the man who had everything, right? What do you get him? He's got everything he wants. He's got a son. What more is there? This is what God was really wanting to bless Abraham with in verse Uh, 16 of Genesis 22. And he said, this is God, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, for because you have done this thing, have not withheld your son, your only son, that in blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. Now, when God provided for Abraham, he provided generously, not just the need for that moment, but for the whole world. He didn't just provide a ram in the thicket, although that's what we see right there. He provided his son ultimately through the faith of Abraham that we can all receive Jesus Christ, who is the only spotless lamb that was slain for us. And think about this, not just all the world at that time, but Abraham was blessed to be a blessing to all the earth of all time, past, present, and future. All time, all people are blessed because of Abraham. That's the kind of blessing that God wants to get to you. Not just your car fixed, but a car lot and multiple cars, and giving away cars, giving away things, that you're blessed to be a blessing. Again, it's very selfish to tell God, oh, I don't need anything. I've got everything I need. Well, what about others? Are you just thinking about yourself? Well, yes, I'm just thinking about myself in that case. Say, all right, well, Lord, I'm thinking about somebody else then. Lord, I need more. And when you start looking at others, then you start saying, Lord, I need a whole lot more. I don't just need my pantry filled. I need a warehouse to be able to feed the people that you've put in my heart to feed or to take care of. You're needing more because you're doing more. As a church, we need more. I'll tell you right now, financially, we are blessed. And we don't need anything right now for our bills or whatever. We're caught up. We're going to stay caught up. We are a blessed church. But I'm telling you, we need more, not for anything except just to reach the lost and to help those that need it. Amen? So that the government doesn't have to do it. The reason the government is doing it is because the church has stopped. But I believe there's something coming. There's a shift that's taking place to say, okay, there is a mighty move of the Holy Ghost and a revival in this land where churches are going to start standing up, preaching the gospel and taking care of those that have needs again. Amen. You watch. It's going to be awesome. But here's Jesus, right? The whole world, Jesus later as we see him walking up that hill to Golgotha as he's got this cross on his back. And he says, God, here's the wood for the sacrifice. And I know I'm the sacrifice. And as Isaac, not knowing he was carrying the wood for his own sacrifice, here's Jesus knowing I'm carrying the wood for my own sacrifice, this cross. And he said, I need some help. He, to prove his, his humanity, 
that he was a man. He was God, but he was also man. He couldn't, and he fell beneath the weight of that cross. And they had to get Simon of Cyrene to come and to pick up that cross and to help carry that cross and say, I'm going to help you. I just think it's awesome, the people that Jesus identified with. And Jesus said, of all people in all time, he said, Simon of Cyrene, you're going to help me carry this cross. And he did. And then they got up there. He died between two thieves. Of all people for him to die, the first person to say, remember me when you come in your kingdom was a thief. And Jesus said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. I'm already seeing the fruit of my sacrifice right here next to me. Wow. Let's all stand. When God provides, he provides generously. He provides more than enough. All sin of all time has been forgiven. Past, present, and future. It's important to realize that. God loves you. He's not against you. He wants to provide for you. I ask people all the time, you know, if, if you died, would you go to heaven? I know people say no. Some people say I would go to hell. I say, why, why would you say that? They say, because God's mad at me. I know God wants to kill me. No, he doesn't. Why would he have sent his son to die for you in your place if he wanted you dead or wanted to hurt you in any way? The fact is, God wants you very blessed. He wants you so blessed that you're able to give to others. And you might be on a fixed income. There are some people I just hear in your mind, you're thinking, I'm on a fixed income. Let me tell you, God's fixing your income. Yeah, it's fixed because God's fixing it. And he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask, think, or imagine. I don't know about you, but I can imagine quite a bit. I can imagine some pretty cool things. And God says, hey, I'm going to do more than you can imagine here in Granbury. Woo. All right, Lord. Wow. In little Granbury? What did he do with Bethlehem? Oh, little town of Granbury. How still we see the light. Hey, you're even in the right key. That's awesome. (laughs) He's bringing provision for you. But he brings provision for the vision. Stay focused on him. Say, Lord, I'm walking after you. Be so hungry for God. I'm telling you, that's how I've gotten everything I've gotten in life. That's how I got my wife. That's how I got my my family, the blessings of the Lord. I'm just focused on Jesus. And it's so cool because as your, as the Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a great thing, a good thing, but I believe it's great from the Hebrew translate, paraphrasing. He who finds, but that, that means he, he who finds a wife while, while following Jesus, she, you just find her there. Whoa. I was so focused on Jesus. I was just like, Jesus, I love you. And then one day, boom, while I'm working in ministry, boom, there's, she just appeared. I was like, oh, answer to prayer. If you're believing God for a spouse, let me encourage you. Don't go chasing them everywhere. I always tell people it's like a triangle. Young people especially, listen up. It's like a triangle. God is at the apex. You're right here on this angle. You focus toward God. This is your spouse. They're focused toward God too. And you're going to meet in the middle. But if you go chasing after her or him, and he's going after God, you're going to miss because you're chasing people, not him. She's going to be there. He's going to be there. You focus on the Lord. Go after him 100%. I'm telling you, if you'll just do that, every blessing comes that way. It's awesome. Let's bow our heads. Lord, I just pray a blessing on every person here today. Not just so we can heap it up on our own lust, our own desires, but Lord, that we'll be able to be a blessing to others also and just to establish your covenant that you promised Abraham that through him all the people of the earth would be blessed if they will be children of Abraham by faith. To say, Father Abraham had many sons and many daughters, but they're by faith, not even by lineage. And by faith, we say we have that same faith to believe you, God, for big things. If you're here this morning, you say, you know, I don't know if I died today, I don't know if I would go to heaven. You can't know for sure. 
The Bible says all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we're all in the same boat. And the wages of sin is death. But you don't have to be afraid of death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, he's paid the price. He's paid your fines. You're debt free. You can just say, okay, Lord, I'm trusting you, Jesus, as my Savior and as my Lord. And now I want to serve you all the days of my life. If you want to pray that prayer, I want to pray a prayer for you that will birth you into the kingdom of God. Do words really work? Does that little prayer really work? It does. If you're getting married and you say, I do, you become married. In the same way, if you say, Jesus, I do, then you become born again. You're in covenant with him and you become a partaker of what God has paid for you to have. So if you're here this morning, you say, I want to ask Jesus into my heart. I want to come to God or make sure of my salvation. On the count of three, I want you to lift your hand up high. One, two, three. Lift it up high. Say, pray for me. Thank you. I see that hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Praise God. I see people that are saying, I want that. And I believe God wouldn't have paid that price if he didn't want you to have it. Amen. He wants you to have it. So I want you to just, everyone pray this prayer with me with your heart and your lips out loud. Just say, Father God, I come to you now in the name of Jesus. God, wash me, cleanse me, and set me free. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me a passion for the lost. Give me a hunger for the things of God. And a holy boldness to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am saved. I am born again. I am forgiven. And I'm on my way to heaven. Because I have Jesus in my life. Amen. And amen. Let me tell you, if you prayed that prayer, all your sins are forgiven. I didn't say it. The Bible says it. It doesn't matter what I say or what I believe to you. What matters is what God says and what his word says about you. Above all else, God's opinion makes everyone else's opinion irrelevant. So just trust that. Lay hold of that and leave this place being a blessing. Go find somebody to bless this week. Show the love of Jesus. And and then maybe you don't have the blessings coming in yet. Start them going out. Start sowing those seeds. Just like Johnny Jesus seed. You go around and you go around sowing these Jesus seeds everywhere. And then over time, you're just going to look back and say, where did all this blessing come from? It's not something you try. It's something you do. So just do it. Well, again, the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and may he give you peace in Jesus' name. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. We pray that you have been blessed by God's word. For more information, visit us online at heightslife.org.